Hi everyone, a little update on my COVID recovery. I'm much better, but still feel more tired than usual, have heaviness in the chest, and still have remnants of a cold. Um, In this episode, I have to tell my parents the results of my pathology test. Episode 11, Mom and Dad, I have cancer. Now came the difficult time of telling my family I had cancer. They all knew about my appointment that day. Until that moment, I had little concern about what they were feeling, but it wasn't due to lack of sensitivity. Having been withdrawn from my own sentiments, their emotions were not at the forefront of my mind. Since tumors suggest cancer, had they struggled with that possibility all day? So how the heck was I going to tell my parents their baby girl has stomach cancer and would need a very risky operation? Certainly not with a phone call. During the drive, I became methodical and I put my resources to work immediately. No one had to tell me what to do, nor did I have to ask, for some odd reason. It was as though I had gone through this before and my instincts took over. I was in for the fight of my life, and I needed to know I was in the best of hands. There didn't seem to be anyone within my circle who knew an expert in stomach cancer. No immediate information was available for referrals or the disease itself, since I hadn't known anyone who had this type of cancer. What I did know was that the hospital that diagnosed me was not a cancer or research hospital. So where would I go? My best option was to ask everyone I knew about getting a referral for a gastric surgeon. I spoke with one of my employers, Leanne, to give her the news. We also discussed finding a surgeon in the field. She would check with her sister, a hematologist, if she could refer me to a specialist. It wasn't that I didn't have confidence in the surgeon that agreed to handle my case, but he was a general surgeon. A specialist in this field of medicine would likely increase my chances, right? I also believed post-op treatments should be done at the same institution, which I felt were better funded at a larger hospital. Thanks for listening this week. I really hope that we can all agree on how to stop this viral spread of coronavirus. Let's follow recommendations from professionals. You have COVID, keep it to yourself. Unfortunately, we don't know we have it until we've already spread it to others. The only logical way to keep it under control and hopefully kill the virus altogether is to continue to social distance, wash our hands, and wear a mask. Be safe and be well. How does bad news affect those around you? What advice do they give you? Are they there for you? It's sad knowing there are so many who don't have loved ones or friends to help them through difficult times. Keep yourself emotionally available for those around you. Wouldn't you want that from them? Episode 12 is part two of Mom and Dad, I Have Cancer. My other employer, Howard, came on the line when Leanne passed on the news. He and I had been friends as well as colleagues since 1990, when we worked together at a large law firm once he graduated from law school. I helped him start his own firm almost a year later and ended up working with him until my diagnosis. I'd like to think I was his right-hand man. His family and friends would tell me Howard felt that way too. We continue to keep in touch. All I remember from my conversation with Howard is do whatever they tell you. I never forgot those words. He admitted a few years following my ordeal that he thought I was crazy for going through so many tests. In one way, I thought his comment was funny. On the other, it just goes to show you how unexpected this was for everyone. Howard never knew all my symptoms so would obviously question my paranoia. I never took my health issues too seriously either. 
If the helpline nurse wouldn't have told me to go to the hospital, I don't know where I would be today. Perhaps not writing this survival memoir. We turned onto Maritain Street, where my parents lived. As I stared out the window, the homes, the cars, and the people began to appear further than they actually were. The drive up to the house was unusual. I felt everything pulling away from me and a sense of loneliness encircling me. The detachment was so strong, I almost felt consoled. It's amazing how our brains cope at a different level during trauma. So how the heck was I going to tell my parents their baby girl has stomach cancer and I would need a risky operation? I had no recollection of the exchanges between Mariano and myself during the drive or the thought process of what I could say to my family. Mariano tells me, you were quiet and you weren't crying. I suppose the telephone calls were a great distraction for me. Mariano parked the car on the driveway in front of the basement entrance. My mother was taking care of my daughter and my nephew, which she did every day while my sister and I went to work. We were lucky to have a healthy stay-at-home mom to help raise our children. My mother-in-law was also there since she knew we were receiving important results. When we'd walk in the house, there were usually aromas that filled the air. Homemade tomato sauce brewing or chicken cutlets frying would tell your stomach, why go home and make dinner? And the baking. My mother was also constantly making cookies and cakes Her famous birthday cake was large enough to feed at least 25. The Easter bread was sometimes baked just because there were little grandchildren around. They loved the mini buns so much. Today was different, and ironically, no one was in the mood for food. As I entered the family room, which at the time we called the playroom, those familiar surroundings became comforting, even for me. Mariano entered ahead of me. It was as though my parents were waiting by the door for us. It's cancer, and she has to get operated. In Italian, my mother pleaded, don't even joke about that. She came toward me. It's true, I added. My mother cried helplessly. My parents became quiet. Each took their respective place in their comfort zone. My mom sat in a chair at the metal table in the kitchen, and my dad in his reclining chair in the family room. He didn't sit back in it as usual, but near the edge. I gave my mom a hug from behind. No words, no possible comfort, only stillness. After a few moments, I went to my dad, squatted down, and put my hand on his lap. No words, no possible comfort, only stillness. They were both pensive and teary-eyed. My heart hurt from their pain. How could I stop this from destroying my family? They tried to keep their emotions at bay, probably for my sake. But I felt that if they could, they would scream at the top of their lungs. They knew what this meant dreaded what was to come. I didn't cry. I couldn't. I had to be strong. Being in control during critical times was normal for me. At that point, my emotions were unknown. My state of shock protected me, like an armor, to mask all that was fuming inside. But even in this unrecognizable and vulnerable state, how could I be so unyielding Listening and being present in someone's life should not be an effort. It should be in your heart. Your life can wait a moment. Thanks for listening.